ashes. And, and I'm glad this discussion was open, but I have a problem with it. And not that the definition or the, of what has been the history of terror and oppression that's uh, been inflicted on African people. And not that uh, African people, black people, uh, should not uh, hold the reins of defining what this oppression and exploitation that we are experiencing is all about. The reason I have a problem with it is because white people discovered what they call fascism after uh, imperialism, white power, capitalism was doing to white people something similar to what it was already doing to black people. And if we can say that what was happening to black people predated fascism, then why the hell would we call what's happening to us fascism, classic or otherwise? Why aren't we demanding that white people define what the hell they are experiencing as something different uh, than, uh, why would they have to define getting hurt differently from how other human beings get hurt? How is it that we have to say fascism is when, essentially when the same thing is happening to white people that's been happening to black people every place, one. Two, even though fascism, uh, uh, what was characterized as fascism, what happened to us predated what was happening in Europe, the fact is that the Europeans were doing the same damn thing to black people in their external colonies, whether it was in Nigeria, whether it was in Jamaica, whether it was in all these other places, and the same is true of the Italians who uh, uh, always have been engaged in colonial domination. And the thing that worries me about this whole struggle against fascism, because ultimately what it seems to infer is that we are struggling for a better colonizer or a better imperialism. Because the struggle against fascism defines one sector of white power is the thing that we have to fight and worry about. Uh, for when we've suffered from democratic socialism, these were not democratic capitalists, these were not fascists, who were lynching us, and these are not fascists who initiated the, the, the slave trade, these are not fascists who were dominating us in Congo, who killed maybe 10 million African people in, uh, in Congo along Leopold. These were democratic. In many instances, they were anti-fascists who were doing this to us. Uh, Roosevelt, was a, who fought the great war against fascism, was locking up Japanese in concentration camps in this country, even while black people were catching hell. And I have a problem with that because I want white people to redefine their reality as opposed to us having to become fighting against fascism. Because what you're fighting against fascism, as it was applied to the discussion about, about, about uh, the guy who preceded Trump that I mentioned earlier on, uh, who uh, Obama was running against. Uh, uh, who was it? McCain. McCain. Uh, what that meant is vote for Obama. Don't, to be against a kind of gentler colonialist or imperialist than against McCain. And the same thing is true with Trump. But what has, and let me tell you this, uh, during the, 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 uh, uh, the, the 50s, uh, when this whole struggle against fascism uh, emerged, in the 40s and 50s, the Communist Party of the United States, uh, the International, the Communist International, uh, that meant the Soviet Union initiated this huge struggle against, United Front against fascism. That's what it was all about. And that meant that, it, what it meant in practical terms was that people who were engaged in struggle, whether it was in Vietnam fighting against the French, whether it was uh, uh, in Africa fighting against the British, uh, all these other places that we had, to, we had to smother our struggles in order to, to maintain the united front against fascism, which was something that was happening to white people. White people are going to have to take their own chances, just like everybody else. And I want them to become a part of the world as opposed to the man that the world become part of them. And the reason I'm having this discussion, uh, I think it's important, is because the whole white left continues to talk about, to us about fascism and the struggle against fascism and what have you, uh, when, when uh, the Communist Party USA, during this time of the struggle against fascism, do you know that the Communist Party of the USA used its Japanese members of the Communist Party USA to get the other Japanese in the damn concentration camps in this country? So I, I'm saying that I really believe that when we fight, then this debate came up, Emil Carl Cabral. You, you quoted Cabral, uh, uh, Charles Barron, uh, because he was talking about how Portuguese leftists were saying to him, that, because Portugal, as you know, had held in colonial domination 
uh, serve several African territories. And the progressive and left Portuguese were saying to people who were fighting a war against colonial domination uh, by the Portuguese that, that if you unite against fascism in Portugal, then that would mean the end of colonialism. And Cabral said, I don't know about that, but I do know this. If, you, if we defeat Portuguese colonialism, fascism will collapse. And that's exactly what happened. That's what brought fascism down in Portugal, the success of the revolutionary movement against colonialism, uh, 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 against Portuguese colonialism. So I just, think, I just think, I want us to be able to continue this discussion. And I think it's a really important discussion, particularly at this time, and uh, that we should continue to, uh, to have. Uh, because uh, uh, I, my experience, uh, uh, I think about uh, Amiri Baraka using the analogy of what happened in Germany and what happened here. Because if you want to find the, what looked like the first proto-fascist uh, movement that happened in this country, you saw it in the 1950s. You saw the McCarthy, McCarthy era. You saw uh, the, the lynching of the uh, Rosen, uh, Luxembourg. You saw uh, uh, the Communist Party driven underground because of the terror and what have you. I mean, you saw a real movement, a war, that was being made against the so-called left. But the black community didn't fight against fascism. The black community fought for freedom. And the thing that kept the damn society open during that time was Fan Lou Hamer, was all these black people who were marching, demonstrating, fighting for freedom for black people. That was the thing that kept the thing from going fascism. That's what I believe that we have to really concentrate on looking at in a very serious way because we'll break the whole damn thing down. As opposed to democratic colonialism, you have fascist colonialism and some other, and during the, during the, the, the same period that Brother Glenn was talking about, uh, early 1900s and something, the Communist International uh, uh, had a meeting in Stuttgart uh, where they were actually a, 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 a position that came out uh, in the international that called for socialist colonialism. Socialist colonialism uh, actually was on, debated, and the ones who called for socialist colonialism won the debate. Uh, and this is in the Communist International. So what I'm saying is that it's, you know, these huge struggles that have happened and how we define them, I think, is critically important because when white folks mean to say socialism, they mean something usually what different from what I mean when I say socialism. When I say socialism, I'm talking about an attack on parasitic capitalism. I see white people want to talk about socialism, but they don't want to talk about the economic basis, the foundation of capitalism altogether, which is slavery and colonialism. I want to attack parasitic. I hear white people who are against socialism, capitalism, but they won't say they're against parasitic capitalism, which is the relationship. This is the thing that gave rise to the whole capitalist social system. I, I've over-talked it. I know that, uh, but I think it's important. Also, uh, I think that, uh, that uh, what Glenn was talking about in terms of, uh, I'm sorry, John. Uh. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead, comrade. Uh, yeah. Mr. Glenn Ford is from Chicago, right? No, he's from uh, Glenn Ford's Jersey. From Jersey? Who, yeah. Who's from Chicago? Uh, about... Raise your hands if you're, from, if you're from Chicago, coming from Chicago. Cam Howard, that's the brother who wrote on the thing that you appreciate about reparations. Oh, okay. All right. The reason I brought up Chicago, because um, Chicago is very important in this, what we're talking about. Because uh, when Martin Luther King uh, came down to Miami, you know, to speak all the time, uh, the city of Miami Police Department made sure that he'd be picked up at the airport. <laughs> and, and Martin Luther King was a whole. <laughs> Provided girls for him made sure that he got back all right. But when Martin Luther King came to Chicago, yeah. the police weren't around. And they knew that somebody was there to kill Martin Luther King. Now, who was the mayor? Daly. Yeah. Mayor Daly. Yeah. Now, who is the mayor of Chicago now? Emmanuel, yeah. who used to work for Mayor Daly. Daly. And who is Obama? His uh, wife was a lieutenant 
and Delhi's machine. That's enough said. But even Jared, the woman who is his uh, special advisor, is the niece of Vernon Jordan, who is the one who had audition, uh, had Obama audition for the bourgeoisie. Vernon Jordan is a Negro that you and I worked for at one time. Uh, and, and who is the one who had the blue dress of, uh, that, that uh, Clinton had ejaculated on and uh, uh, tried to get, to get from Monica Lewinsky? Uh, and and his, his niece, his niece is in, is Obama's main assistant in Obama's Valerie office Jared. now. Valerie Jarrett. Val Valerie Jarrett. And if you remember, uh, if you remember uh, uh, how, what was the guy who was the governor of Illinois, uh, the one with the funny hair, who they put in jail, they could, uh, what was his name? Lugoyevich. They said they did that to Lugoyevich because he was selling a position. Now you tell me, how the hell you have a situation where you had, uh, what's this guy's name, Rom, Rom, the, the, the Zionist Emmanuel, uh, who comes in as chief of staff straight out of Chicago, and then he, uh, you had the, the and they had the, the, the mayor of, uh, of uh, Chicago, but didn't he resign or something like that? Uh, somebody resigned, and then, and then Rahm Emanuel goes back to Chicago, and then Adele takes his place. Adele takes his place in Obama's office. You tell, now they got one cracker in jail, for doing the same thing, you're talking about who was the governor, and then here comes Obama and does the same thing, uh, 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 and you tell me that wasn't selling a position. So, uh, yeah, I, I know what you're saying in terms of, uh, of uh, Daley and his influence, and that was, uh, by the way, when Fannie Lou Hamer said, in 1964, I fought to get into the Democratic Convention, which was held uh, in, in New Jersey, uh, and in 1968, when I finally got there, I fought to get out. You remember what 1968 was, right? In uh, the Democratic Convention. And that's when they had bayonets and what have you and uh, attacking the people and the mobs, et cetera. And uh, uh, that's the occurrence. But the question of, of political, of electoral politic and our participation in it is a very serious question. As you can see, just from the kind of discussions we're having up to now. I mean, when's the last time you heard you had a discussion around electoral politics like this, right? Uh, I think it's, a, it's a, a testimony to how significant it is. And Penny was going to raise something. Go ahead. Where's the mic? Oh, Hura, Chairman. Uh -huh. I just wanted to express unity with what you were talking about in terms of the question of fascism and totally unite that it is not about, you know, talking about what white people did to other white people. Um, as fascism is what the whole white population has done to African people, indigenous people, Arab people, right on. Asian people for hundreds of years yeah. when, as we've said, there yeah. was no word yeah. for genocide, there was yeah. no word for, for these atrocities, these terrors that white people have, have committed. And that, you know, Jews were part of Europe when Germany was killing the Nama and Herrera They were people. Germans. When the, when the Germans yeah, were, they were killing Germans. us in Namibia, they were the Germans. Jews were Germans. That's right. Yeah. That's right. They didn't say, oh, they might come after us. <laughs> yeah. They, that was that. And then it's been elevated to this white question that sets the terms for everything. And the question is that there's, as you say, colonialism inside this country. And white people are the colonizers. I mean, that's just so clear. That's why... There's two different economic systems, political systems, justice systems, all of these things, one for white people, one for African and other oppressed people. And I think that this is why that the question of reparations to African people has to be key and white people have to unite with it. And as we're doing the work knocking on doors in this community, in this city, around Jesse Neville's campaign, Unity Through Reparations, we are finding overwhelming support for that. And I think that we're, you know, because we're in a period where there, you know, all these white people are committing suicide or addicted to drugs, and all of this is an epidemic because there's no future for white people in this system, except because they can see they can't be the colonizers around the world anymore because everybody's resisting. And that I think that 
it, it, there are millions and millions of white people who want an honest relationship to African people, and they need to be led by the African community's struggle for self-determination to be able to have a relationship to that. And I, you know, I just think that that is what is really essential, and it's also the elephant in the room that is never, ever, ever talked about, as we've said, as Charles Barron and, and Akile, it's never talked about that this, what, is, what happens to African people in this country now, today, and the relationship of white people to that. And this shows, you know, this kind of campaign shows how that can be reversed and overturned on a mass electoral level. And I think it is very, very dynamic. And I just wanted to say one other thing that you were saying that, that the people who carried these things out were democratic, you know, um, that even King Leopold of Belgium was an abolitionist. He was a leading abolitionist of his time yeah. as he was committing genocide yeah. against African people in Congo. Yeah. And killed maybe 10 million people. Yes. Leopold from Belgium killed maybe 10 million people. And, uh, in, in, uh, and I'm told about this whole significance of what happened to Jews in Germany and, and you can't say that, you can't even make the argument that, as some has, that it was impossible for six million to have been killed for any number of reasons. Uh, you go to jail. If you, have, if you say that in certain places in Europe, if you say that you disagree, it's literal truth. If you make a public statement of disagreement in France, uh, uh, in Germany, uh, in those two places and other places in Europe, you can go to jail. You can be silenced in terms of being able to occupy public spaces and articulate stuff in public spaces. So this is, and that's, there's a reason for that, and I'm glad that you raised the Jewish question. There's a reason for that, because the Holocaust has become a weapon that's used against oppressed people all around the world because capitalism was born through the enslavement of African people and colonization of other people around the world. But what white people did to white people has now been declared the greatest crime in history against people when at least 10 million people, black people, were killed